Hello! If you have watched our previous videos, you might have noticed that we have shown and discussed all Hurston geometries, except one. So, what Hurston geometries are there? We have isotropic geometries, Euclidean, spherical, and hyperbolic geometry. We also have product geometries, h2 times r and s2 times r. And there were also videos about salt and nil. The last geometry is denoted with this strange symbol, which reads as the universal cover of SL2R. And SL2R means the special linear group that is the set of the 2 times 2 matrices over reals of determinant 1. What does this mean? Before we discuss fascinating non-Euclidean stuff, let us start with some basic concepts illustrated by the boring Euclidean plane. If you look at the tiles, they are just two-dimensional. To describe the position of a tile, we need its two coordinates. But look at the people here. If we just talk about where they are, it is sufficient to tell their x and y coordinates. But what if we wanted to say something about their movements in this animation? They are not changing their x and y coordinates, but they are still rotating, so there is still some movement. For example, the princess and the vizier are standing in the same place, but looking in the opposite directions. This means we need three dimensions to describe a person. Two dimensions of the Euclidean plane, and the third one about the angle at which they are turned. We will call this third dimension phi. Moreover, this three-dimensional space will be called the space of motions of the Euclidean plane. Speaking more formally, a motion is an orientation-preserving isometry. Fine, we have a three-dimensional space. Now it's time to figure out its geometry. Intuitively, geometry tells us how distances and angles work. Let us define distances in our three-dimensional space. It will be pretty straightforward. When the princess moves one hexagon, she also moves by one unit in our space of motions. When she moves four hexagons, she, of course, moves four units. However, we also have this phi dimension related to the rotation angle, and we need to measure the distances in this dimension. We will be measuring the angles in radians, so now the princess is rotating by three radians, which corresponds to the distance of three units in our space of motions. So, the princess has taken a path in the space of motions and she has reached her goal in seven units, four moving in the x-coordinate and three in the phi-coordinate. Could we connect these two motions with a shorter path? We could, by going along the diagonal in the space of motions. We assume here that our space of motions works locally similar to the Euclidean space, that is, we can use the Pythagorean theorem here. So, the vizier reaches the target motion in just 5 units. How awesome is that? Imagine a bird living in the world that follows the geometry of our three-dimensional space of motions. Here is a visualization of what that bird would see. We assume that light rays always take the shortest path. The two-dimensional picture in the right corner shows the motion corresponding to the bird's current location. We have constructed walls within our Euclidean plane, and these walls also extend into 3D space, mirroring their placement in the plane. Each flat hexagonal wall is visualized as a hexagonal prism. The vertical lines here, such as the edges of these prisms, are called fibers. Holes are left for ocular visualization. 
As we can see here, this space is very similar to the standard Euclidean three-dimensional space. The only difference here is that the bird can see itself. This is because when we rotate by 360 degrees, or 2 pi radians, we return to the same motion. If the bird looks in the pi dimension, it sees itself. So, it is just like the Euclidean three-dimensional space, but looked in the pi dimension. Let us go non-Euclidean now. Replace the Euclidean plane with a sphere of radius 1. What do you think the sphere's space of motions will look like? You could use the same intuition as before. So, we have spherical geometry in the x and y dimensions. We also need to add the third dimension, phi. But how should we add this third dimension? An obvious choice is to add it just like before, to obtain the product geometry. You could have seen this geometry in our non-Euclidean portals video, and we are also showing it here. However, this needs to be corrected. Do you see why? This is because in spherical geometry there is a phenomenon related to the space curvature. This phenomenon is called holonomy. To understand holonomy, look at how the cat is moving here. First, it is moving 90 degrees to the east. Then, it is moving 90 degrees to the north. And then 90 degrees to return to its original place on the sphere. Hold on! The cat was moving without any rotation. Yet, somehow, the cat is rotated after doing all these moves. Without holonomy, the space of motions of the Euclidean plane has the product geometry, in this case just the wrapped three-dimensional Euclidean geometry. Due to the holonomy in spherical geometry, it will not be as straightforward. To take this into account, we need to understand holonomy better. What is the change in phi that we get due to the holonomy? Note that we got rotated by 90 degrees due to holonomy, which equals p divided by 2. This is also the area of the spherical triangle we moved around. This is not a coincidence, but a general rule for a sphere of radius 1. Holonomy rotates us by the angle equal to the area inside the loop. As a result, instead of a direct product geometry, we have a twisted product geometry, where moving in a loop moves us in the phi dimension. If you have seen our video explaining the near geometry, you should recognize this idea. Near is a twisted product of the Euclidean plane with reals. Here is a quick visualization of near geometry. Look at those twisted fibers. So, the space of motions of the sphere should look similar. To recapitulate, the space of motions of the Euclidean plane is E2 times S1. We say S1 instead of R because it is wrapped into a circle. Near is the twisted product of E2 with R and the space of motions of S2 is the twisted product of S2 with S1. So now we can see what this space of motions looks like. Do you recognize this geometry? We will remove some walls to make it easier to recognize the space. This looks like our old friend, three-dimensional spherical geometry. Is this a coincidence or is there some deeper connection? While well, the motions of the sphere are the same as the rotations of the sphere, uh, which are the same as the rotations of the 3D Euclidean space around it. If you are into 3D graphics, you might have heard about quaternions being used to represent such rotations. A quaternion is a kind of a four-dimensional number. The quaternions that correspond to rotations are the unit quaternions that form a three-dimensional sphere. 
However, Q and minus Q represent the same notation. So, just like in the motion space of the Euclidean space, uh, we got to the same point if we moved by 2 pi in the phi direction. Uh, here, Q and minus Q are the same point. As a result, it is not really a sphere, but a so-called elliptic space, like the sphere, but where antipodes become the same point. Guess what? Now it's time to consider the space of motions of the hyperbolic plane. The hyperbolic plane also exhibits holonomy, so the intuitions we have built so far will work for us. So the space of motions of the hyperbolic plane will be twisted h2 times s1. So we can go to the visualization now. Let us discuss its mathematical structure. Just as the motions of S2 corresponded to quaternions, the motions of H2 correspond to split quaternions. These are also four dimensional numbers, but the multiplication rules are different, and the unit split quaternions now form a hyperboloid. We are getting close to explaining the strange name of this episode's geometry. Recall that SL2R is the group of 2 times 2 matrices with determinants 1. The split quaternions have the same structure as 2 times 2 matrices as shown in the slide. The unit split quaternions correspond to 2 times 2 matrices with determinant 1. The difference between SL2R and the space of motions of H2 is that, again, the opposite matrices are identified, so this is called PSL2R. The P here stands for projective and refers to unifying the antipodes. Now we need to explain the concept of the universal cover. Look at this circle. It can be seen as a wrapped line. The circle can be obtained from the line by gluing some points. We say that the line is the covering space of the circle. The universal cover is the largest possible covering space in which all the possible loops are unwrapped. Let us see some examples. We denote the universal cover by this tilde. The motion space of E2 is E3 with points identified when we move 2 pi in the phi direction. Its universal cover is simply E3. Note that in this universal cover, moving by 2 pi or 4 pi or 6 pi and so on in the phi direction brings you to different places. The motion space of S2 is S3 with antipodal points identified. Its universal cover is simply S3. Contrary to the previous example, every point is unwrapped to a pair of points this time. When you move 4 pi in the phi direction, you return to the same place. Equivalently, moving by 2 pi is the same as moving by minus 2 pi. We call it a double cover. Such an equivalence might not be intuitive, so let us see a geometric explanation. Imagine the cat moving around the equator of a sphere, creating a loop. What is the area inside this loop? It is half of the area of the whole sphere, so it is 2 pi. Alternatively, we can also consider the other hemisphere to be inside the loop made by the cat. The areas are the same. However, holonomy also depends on the direction of rotation. This time, the cat goes clockwise around this hemisphere, which corresponds to moving minus 2 pi in the phi dimension. By convention, counterclockwise rotations are positive and clockwise rotations are negative. So, to sum up, 
in the universal cover of the motion space of S2, moving by 2 pi has to be the same as moving by minus 2 pi. The motion space of H2 is PSL to R. What is the universal cover of PSL to R? Is it SL to R? Unfortunately, no. SL to R is a covering space of PSL to R, but it is again a double cover. For H2, just like E2, areas can get arbitrarily large. So a double cover will not be enough. We will need infinitely many layers for the universal cover. If you have an excellent for the imagination, you can think about how these layers relate to the shape of the set of unisplit quaternions. To summarize, here are the various ways of looking at this last Perston geometry. Perston has called it the universal cover of SL. It is also the universal cover of PSL. It is also the universal cover of twisted H2 times S1, which is simply the twisted H2 times R. In fact, we prefer to name this geometry twisted H2 times R, a rather straightforward construction once you understand how the twisted products work. But for this video, we wanted to explain where the name first on used came from. So, we have explained the last first on geometry. Is this the end of this series about non-Euclidean geometry visualization? No, we have yet to talk about the Berger sphere or the anti spacetime. space-time. Perston did not need them, but they are exciting and relevant too. See more in the follow-up, hopefully quicker than in a year. Thanks for watching and have a great rest of your day.